Good morning, uh, Mount Zion family. Are we doing well today? Yes. That's good to hear. This has been a great, it's been a great, great weekend. We've had some great weather and uh, had homecoming on Friday night. That went really well. Our Hartsville Tigers had a big win and I'm very grateful this morning that I didn't get arrested or tased Friday night. So everybody's been asking me about that. I'm I'm blessed on that. Hey, everybody, let's stand together and let's sing our opening song, There is a Savior. Greet one another. be seated this morning. The first hymn we have is number 334, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. We're going to sing all three verses this morning.
Well, amen and good morning, church. Well, that was pitiful. Good morning, church. Good morning. All right. Some of your teams may have won. Some of them may have lost, but it doesn't matter. The sun came up, and we are grateful for that this morning. I tell you, if you are a guest this morning, we certainly do want to give you a special welcome here to Mount Zion Baptist Church. We are delighted that you are worshiping with us this morning. You'll notice located in the back of your pew a little welcome visitor card. We invite you to take that, fill it out, tear it off at the perforated line, and as the offering plate comes your way this morning, uh, that you would simply deposit that little form there into the offering plate. We don't uh, ask or expect our guests to give, but we ask that that would be your contribution in order that we might have a record of your attendance and not pester you or bug you, but simply thank you uh, for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, if you have your bulletin, just a couple of things I do want to call your attention to. Uh, number one, I do want you to notice this afternoon at four o'clock uh, in one of our ladies, we're actually going to do it in the Women of Joy class all the way down the hall there, Miss Carolyn Puck its classroom. Uh, we're going to have a Guatemala interest meeting at four o'clock this afternoon. Uh, so if you're interested about thinking, you know, uh, about our upcoming trips in the summer to Guatemala, you may want some information. You may not even be interested, but want to hear what it's all about and want to know how you can pray uh, as we approach that. Uh, I hope that you'll make plans to come at four o'clock. Just because you show up doesn't mean you're committing to go. So I want to be clear about that. Uh, but we certainly would love to have you uh, uh, to this afternoon uh, at four um, at four o'clock. It says four thirty, but it's actually four. Uh, I, I do also want you to notice um, uh, that next Sunday night, October 1st, uh, we're going to have New Ground Trio. They're going to be with us in the evening service at 6 o'clock. I hope that you'll come. I hope that you'll invite people to come. And we're going to certainly have a wonderful time of worship and fellowship next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Uh, I do also want you to notice uh, that today is the last Sunday in September. Uh, it is also the last opportunity that you and I have uh, to contribute to the Myers-Mallory State Missions Offering. Uh, I hope that you'll pray uh, about what you might could give to that as we enter our final Sunday, our final week. Uh, those offerings are good. You can give online. You can give uh, through those envelopes located on the back table as the offering plate comes your way in just a moment. Uh, and so we certainly will be accepting those uh, until the conclusion of the month of September. Uh, it's a great way that it funds our Alabama Baptist Ministries, and I'm grateful uh, for the work and partnership of Alabama Baptist. I've got a card here to read this, uh, this morning. It says, To my loving church family, uh, thanks for food, prayers, money, and the lovely wind chime. Johnny and I are so blessed to be part of Mount Zion Church, Shirley Sinclair. Certainly want to be praying for Miss Shirley. Glad that she's here this morning. I uh, certainly want to be praying uh, for her uh, as she uh, continues to deal with the loss of her longtime husband, Johnny Sinclair. Well, I'm certainly delighted that you're, uh, that you're here to worship this morning. Are you glad that you're here? Well, I'm glad. Well, I, we're going to have a great day worshiping the Lord. As we continue to worship the Lord, I want us all... Uh, as we enter into this time, that it's not about us, it's all about Him. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to meet with us this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we are certainly grateful this morning that we have the opportunity to simply come before you in prayer, to come to you and worship, to sing praises to your holy name, because, Father, you are worthy of our praise, worthy the Lamb who was slain. Father, we pray that as we worship this morning in spirit and in truth, in one accord, Father, that our hearts would be in tune with what you desire to imprint upon our heart this morning. But Father, most of all, that our worship would be holy and acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. And so, Father, bless our time of worship. May you be glorified, may Satan be mortified, and that your precious name would be exalted this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Randall. Our next hymn this morning is number 177. One of my favorite hymns, one of the most beautiful lyrical lines. There's something about that name. Join together and sing.
that one more time and let's block the chords, Miss Allison. Sing out, please. And Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 where all Amen. I did forget to announce. I forget a lot of things, you know. Some people say, well, it gets worse when you get older. If it gets worse than this, it's going to be bad. Uh, but I did forget to announce uh, that the uh, if you want to uh, receive the Alabama Baptist, one of the perks of being a member here at Mount Zion, you didn't know you had perks to membership, uh, but if you're a member here at Mount Zion Baptist Church, you receive the Alabama Baptist newspaper for free. Uh, all you have to do is see our chairman of deacons, Mr. R.E. Tapscott, and he'll be happy to submit your name to the Alabama Baptist. And so wave at us, R.E. All right. He, he, he didn't want to wave, but he's on the front there. See that man if you want to receive the Alabama Baptist. As we continue to worship the Lord, I'm going to invite our ushers, if they will, to come forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. As they're coming, let us pray together. Father, your word tells us that every good and perfect gift indeed comes from above. That, Father, everything that you grant to us is good. It is perfect. It is holy. And, Father, how blessed we are to be a recipient of that which you bestow upon your children. But, Father, we pray that as, we're rec as we recognize all that you have blessed us with, all that you have entrusted to us, Father, may we return to you a portion that is rightfully yours, that you would be glorified, that your work would continue, that your word would spread, and that we might as a church family continue fulfilling the great commission on mission for you because of the great commandment. Bless this offering, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
invite you to stand if you're able. And let's sing our praise and worship song today. I worship you, Almighty God. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Randall, Miss Allison, and choir for leading us in worship this morning as we just sang, I worship you, Almighty God, and that is what we have gathered here to do. I do want to extend a sincere word of gratitude uh, to my dear friend, Brother A.G. Stepp, for filling in for me Wednesday night in my absence. I've heard many great things, and so thank you so much for filling in for me. Had a, a great and brief and tiring trip to uh, Washington, D.C., and was privileged uh, to meet with several folks. You know, a lot of people, and, and they are uh, correct when they uh, talk uh, in uh, doomsday-type words when they think of Washington, D.C., and the state of our country. I do want to say, though, uh, a lot of that is true. There are a lot of crooked people on Capitol Hill. There are some, they are few in number, but there are some good, godly people uh, who are sincere in their faith, who are trying to do the right thing on both sides of the aisle, and so it was encouraging to hear some of that. I tell you, you know, I've, I, um, you know how much, uh, how big of an uh, of an Alabama fan I am, but I got to meet with Coach Tommy Tuberville, and we were sitting in his office, and we talked for a while about, you know, football, and we were breaking down Alabama football of all things, and I uh, had some talked about faith and talked about uh, different subjects, and as we were leaving, uh, he uh, he. Uh, he said, well, let's get a picture, and so he took a picture. He put it on his Facebook page, uh, me and just about four other pastors. I've never felt so insulted in my life because there are about 600 comments. I couldn't find a positive one on there, and so uh, just know there's, your preacher was famous, but not in a good way. Uh, but I tell you, it was certainly, uh, certainly a wonderful trip. I want you to take your Bibles, if you have them, please, this morning. Turn with me to the book of James, the New Testament book of James, chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. We're continuing our sermon series through the book of James entitled Practical Christianity. Practical Christianity. How do we live out our faith out loud? How do we live a practical Christian life. You know, we can, get, uh, we can get so concerned about the convoluted theological debates of the century, but you and I uh, are grateful that although God's Word is very weighty in its theology, although uh, it's very clear in its doctrine, I'm grateful that it's also very practical in its application. I'm glad that God has laid out for us through using the people like James and Paul and others some practical ways you and I live out our faith. James, James was a very practical person, and this is a very practical letter. And I want to preach on this subject, three traits to transform your life. Three traits to trans that will transform your life. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. I'm going to invite you to stand as we read God's Word together. 
in honor of his holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible, authoritative, and inexhaustible word this morning, James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. And James writes under divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone, no exceptions there, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. If there's three things worth underlining in your Bibles this morning, those are they. Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Let's pray together. Fathers, we open your word this morning. We are reminded that it is not I, but Christ who lives in us. That, Father, we recognize that we can do nothing in our own strength, nothing in our own wisdom, nothing in our own power. But, Father, that we are totally dependent upon you and your Holy Spirit, that you might empower us to do these things, but that you might illuminate to us the truths of your word. And so, Father, I pray that you'd permit me to preach as a dying man to a dying world in order that people might be brought to the foot of your cross. But most of all, Father, we pray that our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our minds would be open and receptive to that which you desire to imprint upon our hearts this morning. Bless our time together. May you be glorified. We'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for what you do in this moment and in the moments to come. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. We live in a time of information explosion. There has never been a time in history whereby more information is easily and readily accessible and available than the time in which we live. I read recently that over 100 billion emails are sent every day. That's more than 10 times the population of the world. Each day, 5,000 new books are published. And this year, the number of text messages sent will exceed 8.4 trillion. 8.4 trillion text messages. Now, if we take the year that Christ was born as our starting point and took 1,500 years for all the knowledge in the world to double. From the time he was born, it took 1,500 years for all knowledge in the world to double. The next doubling took only 250 years, doubled again in 150 years. By the end of World War II, knowledge doubled every 25 years. Today, knowledge is doubling every 12 months, and soon it will be doubling every month. We, are become, we have more information, more science, more things at our disposal today that information and knowledge and intelligence is doubling at record speed. According to Stephen Davey, if you happen to read the New York Times newspaper for one week, you'll be exposed to more information than the average person living in the 1800s came across in their entire lifetime. If you just read the New York Times daily for a week, you'll, you'll encounter more information than those in the 1800s did in their life. We're swamped by information. 24 hours a day, 365 years, and stories change. It's almost like life is happening live. It's in real time. There is, no, there is no pause. There is no rewind. It just continues to move onward and onward. You know, you can watch the news. If you watch the news on any channel, I don't care what channel it is, if you watch national news, you'll have the, you'll have the anchor that's reading the news, and you'll have, about, you'll have a ticker up top, two tickers on the side, one ticker on the bottom, another ticker on the bottom that scrolls the stocks all the way by. You have have so much information there on one screen that it's almost unfathomable to even take it all in. It moves at rapid rates. But you see, the problem is we're distracted. You and I are so easily distracted in the culture in which we live. The problem is we look without seeing. We listen without hearing. We speak without understanding. We're a wired up, tuned in, hyper caffeinated generation. And unfortunately, it's only getting worse. Some years ago, Bob Morehouse wrote an essay. He called it the paradox of our time. Bob Morehouse, this is a brief expert uh, of that essay. He said, we've learned how to make a living, but not a life. We've added years to life, not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back but have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. We've done larger things, but not better things. We've conquered outer space, but then he said, but not 
in our space. Everything we build today, it's bigger, it's stronger, it's faster, it's larger. We've come a long way in a short time, and the engine of human progress seems to hum right along, but you and I seem to be trapped in the fact that we're not even close to conquering inner space. Now, you could, now people, philosophers could talk about inner space all they want to. I want to kind of bend what Bob Morehouse said. I, I want us to think about that inner space as our spiritual life. There's a lot of people, they're, they're, they've, they've accomplished these things on the outer side. They've, they've got a good job. They've got plenty of money. They've got success. They've got popularity. They've conquered everything. They've got technology. They've got information at their disposal. They've got wisdom. They've got intelligence. But there's a lot of people, they haven't begun to work on what's on the inside. There's a lot of people, they're more concerned with their secular life than their spiritual life. They're more concerned with a carnal life than a Christian life. And you and I have to understand that if we're going to be Christians following the Lord, the Two cannot be separated that everything we do, as I preached last Sunday night, everything we do is in our spiritual walk with God, whether it be buying groceries or whether it be coming to church, everything we do is indeed spiritual. But James has some things to say regarding spiritual living in a fast-paced world. And so I want to give you three traits, three truths that are going to transform your life. These characteristics a redeemed life must be evident. We've got to tune in, we've got to tone down, and we've got to sweeten up. That's God's plan for born-again Christians. Now, God right here in the book of James, as we just read a moment ago, he's given us the blueprints of a righteous life. Now, I read verses 19, I read verses 20, but if you just look up there, it, it, hopefully it won't strain your eyes too much. Look there at verse 18, just what he says there. It says, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. So that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. That means being born again. We've been made wise unto salvation. We have experience. We are now the first fruits. We're a kind of first fruits. That means we are born again, children of God. And one of the monumental problems of the New Testament church from Corinth all the way to today, is that there are a lot of people who are talking about being born again. There's a lot of people who think that they're born again. There's a lot of people, to be honest, they're, not more, they're, they're no more born again than my automobile sitting outside because they, they've convinced themselves they're saved, but, friend, they're not saved. They've deceived themselves into thinking they're born again child of God, and they're not. They're out of fellowship with God. Not only are they out of fellowship with God, they have no relationship with God. And so the problem is that you and I can come to church, we can worship, we can sing these wonderful songs as Brother Randall and Miss Allison just let us in. But if you and I aren't walking with Christ, if we've not experienced Christ, if we're not, uh, if these three principles that we're about to talk about haven't transformed your life, then friend, we've got a more serious problem than what kind of music we're singing or the color of the carpet or the color of the preacher's tie. We've got a lot bigger issues and that means that we might not be born again. Now, let me tell you something. If you've never had the new birth there's, if you've had a new birth, there's going to be some new behavior. You can write it down, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There is a new birth and there is a new behavior. And if your religion hasn't changed your life, you'd better change your religion because you don't have the biblical kind. You can come to church, but if your religion hadn't changed your life, if you're the same thing today as you were when before you, before you met Christ, then you might have met the wrong Christ. You might, have, you might have the wrong religion. You might be following the wrong gods. And so in verse 18, James speaks of the new birth, and then beginning in verses 19 and going through verse 20, he talks about the new behavior. Reminds me of some men, they were standing around and talking about different translations of the Bible. Some were talking about the Revised Standard Versions, and the King James Version, and the New English Bible, and Others were talking about the Amplified Version, and one man spoke up, and he said, I like my mother's translation best. And they said, oh, they said, we didn't know that your mother was a scholar. How did she translate the Bible? And he said, my mother translated the Bible into daily living. Amen. That's the translation that I think we all need. Uh, I, you know, translations are good. We could get into all the mechanics of that. But the, the main point is, if you can't take God's Word and see what the real meaning is and then apply it to your life, we've got deeper problems. And so James talks here about three very pertinent areas of behavior. I want you to notice three, three words of instruction that James gives to us who have been born again. And these traits will in indeed transform your life. Number one, 
I want you to notice you've got to, we've got to tune ourselves in to what God is saying. We've got to tune in to what God is saying, not what we're saying, not what the preacher's saying, not what everyone else is saying. We need to tune in to what God is saying. He says, notice there in your Bibles in verse 19, he says, be quick to hear. Be quick to hear. Now, some people don't have their ears on. I can guarantee if I was a betting man, and I don't bet, I don't gamble, I don't play the lottery, I hope you don't either. Uh, but I, if I was a betting man, I could bet money today that there's one person right now in this sanctuary who hadn't got their ears on. They're hearing, but they're not listening. They've got their ears on, but they're more focused as to what, what are we going to eat after the service, or what am I going to do next week, or is he going to finish on time? Or, or there's going to be something else that's on your mind, something else that's tickling your ears, and you're not listening. Jesus spoke of those who had ears, but they heard not in Mark chapter 8 and verse 18. Now, the Bible says, be quick to hear. That is, be ready to receive the things that God has for us. Now, the Bible does not teach that we're to hear everything there is to hear. There's some things we ought not to hear. That's why Jesus said in Mark 4, 24, he said, take heed what you hear. It means be careful, kind of distinguish, kind of dissect what you are hearing. You don't need to be listening to everything that comes along. There's some people that'll talk to you and they'll make your ear their garbage can. There's some things uh, that we just really ought not to hear. There's some conversations we don't need to be involved in. There's some things we ought not to be listening to. Jesus said, be careful what you hear. But James says, be quick to hear. And what is James talking about? He's talking about being quick to hear the Word of God. Hear what God is speaking to you. Are you ready to listen to God this morning? Some people come to church and they open their Bible, and I tell you, they just sit there, and it's just like a miracle. They say, well, God never speaks to me. Well, there's about a couple thousand pages sitting there in front of you. God has a lot of things to say. The question is, are you willing to listen to what God has to say this morning? Be quick to hear. Be careful what you hear. Now, there are three ways God speaks to us. You want to know how God speaks? I'll give you three things. Number one, God speaks to us through the Scriptures. If there was anything that God has used to speak to man, it has been through His divinely inspired, authoritative Word. He speaks through the Bible. The question is, do you know the book? Do you read the book? Do you study the book? Do you pray over the book? Do you love the book? If not, why not? You see, the Bible is God's revelation. It is how God has spoken to man. You're saying, oh, God, to speak to me. Well, God's saying, if you'll open your ears, if you'll listen, I'll be happy to speak with you. If you pray over it, if you study it, if you read it, if you love it and say, oh, Lord, incline my ear, the Bible says, to thy testimonies. Would you open my ears that I might hear the Word of God? So many people read the Bible and they get nothing from it. They read the Bible as they do any other book. They open it and they close it and they put it on the table. Well, we'll pick up chapter 2 tomorrow. Yet they never listen. Friend, you know, they have all these Bible plans. Read the Bible in a year. Read the Bible in a year. Friend, I'd rather it take you five years and you get something out of it than one year and you listen to nothing. There's a lot of people who have breezed through the Bible and said, I've read the whole Bible. Can you, can you quote some scripture for me? Can you tell me what, what Ephesians was about? Well, I can't really tell you about that. Can you tell me what Philippians was about? Well, I, I can't really tell you. I forgot that part. And so you begin to quiz these people who read the Bible in a year. And to be honest, they haven't read the Bible. They've looked at the Bible. They've, they've had a visible sighting of the Bible. They haven't internalized. They haven't read. They haven't studied. They haven't known God through the scriptures. Now, let me give you five little things if you have the little fly leaf of your Bible, you ought to have a little room there to write. I want to give you, and I really want to speak to either new Christians or young people. I want to, I want to give you five little things that are going to make God's Word come alive in your life for everybody. But for these five things, if you'll just follow these five things, I promise you, God's Word will come alive to you today. Number one, if you, is, if you read any passage of Scripture... You need to ask yourself this question, is there a lesson to learn? 
Is there something out of this passage of Scripture, and there always is, the answer is always yes, uh, so I'll spoil that one, but is there any lesson that I might learn from this passage of Scripture? As you read it, if it's, if it's a few chapters, if it's a few verses, you say, is there any lesson to learn? Number two, you need to ask yourself the question, is there a blessing to enjoy? You know, there are some blessings that are inclusive. It means they're for all people. There are some blessings that are exclusive, that they're only to believers. But is there a blessing to enjoy? When I read a passage of Scripture, not only do I need to see, is there a blessing to enjoy? And not only do I need to see, is there a lesson to learn? Thirdly, I need to ask myself, is there a command to obey? Thirdly, you need to understand, is there a command to obey. Is there something that God in His Word is clearly telling me I need to or I need not to do? The great commandment, there's your, there's your number one commandment, love, love your neighbor, love God, love your neighbor, love. That's, that's the great commandment. The great commission is because we love people, we share the gospel with them. The great commission. Those two things are commandments. Is there a command that I need to obey? Number four, is there a sin to avoid? Oh, is this the big one? Boy, people will live their life. They'll live in sin. They'll try to justify their sin. Well, I didn't read anywhere in the Bible where it said don't do that. The question is, I'll tell you how you really easily apply the Bible to your life. If you wouldn't tell your grandmother what you're doing. Now, some of y'all's grandmothers been been to be with the Lord for 100 years. But if you, t if you wouldn't tell your grandmother what you just did, you probably don't need to do it. But I can guarantee if you think God would be displeased, you probably don't need to do it. I'll give you, I'll give you a quick test here. If you're trying to decide whether something's biblical or something's not, if you're trying to decide whether it might please God or harm God, if you're sitting there trying to decide, the, the obvious answer is to not do it. Oh, you'd be surprised how many people do. Well, would God want me to have this affair? Well, probably not. Why are we even thinking about it? Well, would God want me to steal this money? Probably not. Let, let's, let's back up and let's look at what his word has to say. There are commands we need to obey. There are sins that he clearly tells us to avoid. Number five, is there a new truth to carry with me? Is there something in God's word that is a truth that I need to seal inside my heart? It needs to be imprinted on the walls and the door of my life. It needs to be something that I carry in my satchel at all times as I journey with the Lord. There is something, a truth that I need to carry with me. And just as you read and you begin to see the scriptures come alive in your life, keep asking yourself those questions over and over again so the word of God will get off of the page and into your heart. That's the major problem in Christianity. They own the Word of God. I tell you, in my study, I've probably got 50 Bibles. But what good would 50 Bibles do in my life if they didn't leap inside of my heart? If they didn't apply to my life, if they weren't something that I carried with me, not the physical copy of God's Word, but the spiritual copy, the thing that the Holy Spirit has impressed upon my heart. God speaks through the Scriptures. Secondly, I want to tell you that God speaks through the sermon. What a shocker. God speaks through the sermon. Now, I want to be very clear, and I don't want to be egotistical or arrogant in what I'm about to say, but God calls His preachers to preach. If he didn't, you would have wasted your time getting up this morning. I'd be wasting my time standing here. If God did not call his preachers to preach, the pulpit is a very sacred place. The pastor has been entrusted with the job to guard who gets behind the pulpit to preach. It is a very sacred place. It is a spiritual place. And the Bible says, Romans chapter 10 verse 14, Paul said, How shall they hear without a preacher? Now, I'm not being vain or egotistical when I tell you that God has empowered me to preach. I can say, like the prophet Isaiah said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for the Lord hath anointed me to preach. If he hadn't anointed me, I need to sit down and find some other, some other thing to do with my life. If he hadn't called me to the ministry, I don't need to be touching God's Word in a way that it might be preached and proclaimed. And you, and, but what the scary thing is about preaching is that God holds me accountable with what I preach. I tell you, there's sometimes I get out of the pulpit and I think I was wrong about that. And boy, I tell you, the Lord deals with me all week. You ought, to come, you ought to come to my house Sunday night. You'll find me sitting at my desk thinking about all the things I said wrong. You see, there, God holds his preachers accountable as to 
what they preach. And the Bible tells us to be very careful the way we preach. In 1 Peter 4.11, if you'll write that down, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles, as the word of God. Now, some people think their criticism of the preacher makes a difference. Sometimes it does. I'd, I'd, I'd like to think I'd take some criticism. Well, some criticism. If, if somebody says harsh words don't bother them, they're just lying to you. It bothers everybody. But I tell you, if you come to me and say that was a horrible sermon, well, I'm on, that's going to hurt my feelings. But to be honest, it doesn't matter what any of us think. To be honest, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what God thinks because God is the one who holds us accountable for what we do. And the preacher ought to come prepared. But here's the contrary to that. The preacher ought to come prepared. The hearers ought to come prepared as well. When we come to worship the Lord, when we come to hear the Word of God open, it is incumbent upon me but also you that we would be prepared to what God is saying. Now, I don't care if you get anything out of the illustrations or the quotes or anything, but when God's Word is spoken, you ought to leave church on Sunday morning saying, I learned something, I found a truth, something impacted me this morning. If nothing's impacted you, there is a problem because I guarantee God will judge you on what you've heard but he'll also judge you on what you should heard and never listened to. You know, it reminds some people can sit in church and look straight at the preacher and have th other things on their mind. But, you know, there's some people that they come to church and they, they close their eyes. They call it meditation. Somebody told me one time, they said, I, uh, I'll tell you, I, somebody in here knows it. We both heard it at the same time. Said, you know, I go to get church to get refreshed. If I can't get it from the sermon, I'll get it from the nap. And so, you know, there are some things that refresh us. There's some things that uh, defresh us, I guess you could say. But, you know, I, there was a preacher one time. Somebody came up to him. He often fell asleep during the services. He asked the preacher. He said, I want to know a prayer, just, just something uh, just something that when God's Word is presented, I, I want a prayer uh, that I can say when I come to church. And he said, may I suggest now I lay me down to sleep. Uh, there's some people that may be praying that on Sunday morning. But let me tell you something, friend. You will learn something this morning. If you'll take a notebook, take some notes, and open the Bible and see what God might have to say through this service. You know, I'm not the best preacher in the world. I know that. I'm not, I'm not arrogant to say I am the best preacher. There's preachers that have stood behind this pulpit that could preach circles around me. People can preach the gospel better than I can. But I can guarantee you, as Adrian Rogers said, not a soul can preach a better gospel than I can. There's only one gospel. There's many glorious preachers. And while there are many preachers who can present it much better than I can, they can't present a better, more perfect gospel. Because it's the gospel of Christ. It's the word of God that makes us wise unto salvation. It is the word of God that instructs us. And God will hold us responsible for what we hear and what we ought to have heard. God speaks through the scriptures. He speaks through the sermons. Thirdly, he speaks through the spirit of God. Now, God speaks through the scriptures. God speaks through the sermon, but he speaks through his Holy Spirit. Revelation 3, 6, write it down in your margin. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's another way that God speaks. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. Friend, you couldn't understand this God's Word in your life if it weren't for the Holy Spirit that inspired it, that moved, they were men moved by the Holy Spirit that they may write the Word of God, but also you wouldn't, as we talked about last week, you wouldn't be able to have the revelation or the illumination of God had it not been for the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is how God speaks to our hearts that we might understand the Scriptures. How many of you have a quiet time? I want to ask you this morning. I'm not ask you to raise your hand. Don't stand up and say, I do. How many of you don't have a quiet time? I bet there's a lot of people that they don't. Never, never occurs your mind. You may pray over the meal. You might pray in the shower. But in terms of getting down on your knees and spending five minutes a day with the Lord, how many of you do that? I'll tell you one thing that really spoke to me. Brother Don mentioned it last Sunday. He journals every day of his ministry. He has something journaled. I'm good if I get one journal entry a week in. Every day of his ministry, he's got a count for. He can go on the shelf, pull out his journal, and tell you what happened that day. You see, there are because he spent time with the Lord... I spend time with the Lord. My question is, do you spend time with the Lord? Do you really seek God as to what he's desiring to say? The Bible's clear about that. In the Old Testament, the Bible says, in quiet and in confidence, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. Luke 21, 19 says, possess ye your souls. That means be still, hold, hold on to it. 
Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. And the reason that God doesn't speak to a lot of us is that we're not willing to sit still and that we might listen to what God has to say. Do you like to hold a conversation with someone that does all the talking? I can guarantee not a soul in here likes to hold a conversation with someone who does all the talking. If you do, you're probably the one doing all the talking. Uh, you know, there are some people that you just can't talk to, can't get a word in edgewise, you can't really communicate with, and so you're just a brick wall. If you were a signpost or uh, the President of the United States, you'd be treated the same. They're just going to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and some of you are saying your preacher is like that too. Somebody said an egotist is somebody that talks to himself so much that you can't talk about yourself. Many of us are egotists when it comes to spending time with the Lord. I did a lot of us unfold all of our problems. Oh, Lord, I'm sick. Lord, I, I've got money troubles. Lord, I, I don't feel well. Lord, there's this horrible person at work I can't cope with. Lord, things are happening down at the church house again. Lord, there's something going on. And we give him all of our problems, and then we say, and thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And not a ear has been lent to what God might say to our hearts. We are to be still because the Holy Spirit speaks in quietness. I'm sure if the men who were penning the scriptures were so concerned with what they were saying that more than what God was speaking, I can guarantee this Bible wouldn't have been written. They were more concerned with what God was saying that they might be careful in how they penned the scriptures under divine inspiration. And so James says very clearly, very concisely, be quick to hear. We need to tune ourselves into what God is saying. There's a second thing. I'll move quickly. The second thing is we need to not only tune ourselves into what God is saying, we need to tone ourselves down to what we're saying. We need to tone ourselves down. You need to be quick to hear what God has to say, but look there in verse 19 again. Not only does he say, be quick to hear, he says, slow to speak. Slow to speak. Speak. Not only do we need to tune in, we need to tone down. The plain, unvarnished truth is that most of us talk too much. Many things have been opened by mistake, none so frequent as the mouth. Everything uh, that seems to, uh, every problem that seems to arise in public and social circles is because somebody opened their mouth a little too much and a little too soon. And James says, don't talk as much as you're accustomed to talking. Don't talk to God too much. You can bring anything before God, take time to listen. But don't be so concerned with what you have to say. Proverbs chapter uh, 10, verse 19, you can jot these down. And where there are many words, transgression, that means sin, is unavoidable. It's there, it's coming, but he who restrains his lips is wise. The more you talk, I'm going to get real scientific, real mathematical here. The more mathematical probability there is for sin to come your way. The more you talk and the less you listen to what God has to say, transgression, sin, will become unavoidable. Proverbs, um, Proverbs 21, 3, He who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps his soul from trouble. If you'll guard your mouth, if you'll guard your lips, what's coming out of my mouth, if we'll just pause and, and think about what I'm about to say, it keeps you from trouble. Ecclesiastes 5, 3, for the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. The more a person talks, the more he sometimes proclaims the foolishness of his heart. I love what somebody said. I don't know who said this, probably one of the most famous quotes uh, of all time, at least in my life. It's better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. There's a lot of wisdom in, in keeping your mouth Shut. There's sometimes in my life I can think of things I said five, ten years ago that I think I wish I could take that back. I wish I had never said that. Uh, there are things that still bother me that I think I wonder if anybody remembers I said that. Do you ever have those thoughts? I wish I hadn't said that. I wonder if anybody thinks or anybody remembers what I had to say. You know, a, a, a fool's voice is known by the multitude of his words. James says, be slow to speak. You know, speech may be silver, but silence is golden. And you and I understand that silence is the key in listening to God and in keeping peace with those 
around us. Now, Jesus warned against speaking idle words. The Bible says, be slow to speak. Matthew 12, 16, Jesus was talking about, he said, uh, he said, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, he said, but I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. You know what an idle word is? An idle word is something that's not productive. It's something that yields no fruit, no results. It's pointless. It shouldn't have been said because it is of no substance whatsoever. Ever. The book of James says faith without works is dead. And the word dead is the same words that the Greek used for idle. It means nothing. It's unproductive. It's not alive. And what Jesus is saying is that any word that you speak that doesn't build up, that doesn't edify, that doesn't help, they're non-productive, they're destructive, that you're going to have to give an account of them in the day of judgment. One of these days you're going to have to give an account for what you say, believe it or not. Some of you are getting a little scared, saying I'm going to have to give an account for everything you do. Everything you do, everything you say, you're going to stand before the Lord, and you're going to have to give an account for every idle word that has been spoken. Now, he's not talking about humor and joking and kidding. You, if you know your pastor well enough, you know like, I like to joke as much as the next guy. He's not talking about that. He's talking, though, uh, you know, because I'm sure when Jesus preached, I like to think that Jesus had a sense of humor. And in uh, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 24, when Jesus was talking there and he spoke to those who gagged at a gnat and swallowed a camel, I'm sure they probably broke into laughter. He was talking about how ridiculous some of, they, some of them were in their pretenses. Someone asked Charles Haddon Spurgeon one time, one of the greatest preachers who ever lived, they asked Charles Spurgeon, he said, Mr. Spurgeon, why do you use humor in your messages sometimes? And Spurgeon said with his wit, he said, I tickle my oyster until he opens the shell, and then I stick a knife in him. You see, humor is a great way that paves the way for people to be receptive to the Word of God. It's a great tool that God uses. Now, that's not what Jesus is talking about with idle words. That's not what James is talking about when he's saying be slow to speak. He's not talking about those things that uh, might be humorous. But he's talking about foolish talking that is unproductive. If there's anything that has been more destructive to any church in history, it's idle words. Things that are spoken that shouldn't have been spoken. Things that are said in backroom conversations that somehow get out of things that aren't productive. How many homes, I wonder, are broken? How many people are falsely put in prison because of idle words? How many hearts are crushed? How many families divided? How many church split? How many souls are lost because people have not learned to set a guard on their mouth and be slow to speak? I'm, I'm reminded of the old owl. Some of you may have heard this poem, probably learned it in school. I don't know, but I just, some, for some reason it flooded my mind as I thought about this. A, a wise old owl lived in an oak. The more he saw, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't we all be like the wise old bird? I, there's some wisdom. You and I reckon we're slow to speak. And we need to be quick to hear. If all that we say in a single day with never a word left out were printed each night in clear black and white would make strange reading, no doubt. And then just suppose, ere one's eyes he could close, he must read the day's record through. Then wouldn't one sigh and wouldn't he try a great deal less talking to do? And I more than half think that a many a kink would be smoothed in life's tangled thread if one half that we say in a single day were just left forever unsaid. There are a lot of times that you and I need to pray that we, as the psalmist did in Psalm 141 and verse 3, set a watch, O Lord, on my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. Thirdly and finally, we need to not only tune ourselves into what God is saying, tone ourselves down to what we say, we need to sweeten ourselves up to what God desires. I want you to look there in verse 20 there. Very clear, He's, he says, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. You know, I've met some people, they're just proud of their anger. They're proud to be angry people. I tell you, I met one, somebody one time, they said, I'll tell you what, I just, you know, I'm just an angry person. I guess I can't help it. I'm a redhead. And I said, well, I said, you can help it, but, you know, I, I can't help you on that. But, you know, there's some people proud of their anger. They, they think their anger makes them a man. It makes them a strong person. I'll tell you, when I think of somebody who's angry, I just think of a fool who's going to cause more destruction in anybody he meets or anybody she meets than anybody else they'll encounter. You know, there's some people, you watch the way they... 
And I'm, I'm not opposed to disciplining children. I mean, uh, I, I was disciplined myself. When that belt came off, I knew it was time to hush the mouth. Uh, but I tell you, I, I was disciplined. Thankfully, I stayed out of a lot of trouble. I wasn't as troubled as some. I was pretty troubled, though. Uh, but, you know, there, I don't have children, and so I'm not going to give a parenting class 101 here. Uh, but, you know, when I go to the grocery store and I see people beating their children, I'm not talking just a little spank on the rear end. I'm talking beating them. There's a problem. Because anger is not a way that brings about the righteousness of God. Anger is not a way that you and I are going to please God. Anger is not a way that we live a righteous life. If we're going to be people who are of God, by God, for God, we're going to have to be people who recognize we need to sweeten ourselves up to what God desires. And so James says, be slow to anger. I like what the Amplified Version says. It says, be slow to take offense and get angry. Boy, Southern Baptists could take that word of advice. I tell you, when I go to the Southern Baptist Convention, I tell you, if we could all just, just adhere to this one statement, man, we would have a lot less preachers trying to fight each other in the hallways. I tell you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We need to be slow to anger. Now, the Bible doesn't say never be angry. Jesus was angry. We see he was angry at institutions. He was angry at sins. But not one time in the Bible was Jesus ever angry at an individual. He was, he was angry at the sin. If they committed a sin, he was angry at that. He was angry at the institutions. I can guarantee when he, when he went there at the temple and flipped the tables over, I'm sure there was a little anger there. There was anger throughout Jesus' ministry that we see, but it was righteous anger. It was not anger that was provoked to sin. In Mark chapter 3, verse 5, we see a picture of that. It says, And when Jesus had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the others. Jesus did get angry, but what made Jesus angry was hard hearts in the face of human hurts, and it made Jesus angry. But the Bible says, Be angry and sin not. I can tell you, if you're angry all the time, you're going to commit sin. If you're angry all the time, there's sin in your life. If you're angry all the time that every little thing bothers you and you're provoked to anger, there's a problem because there is a very... It's so easy to let the line disappear between righteous indignation and personal irritation. Some of us, it's just personal irritation. But we need to be careful that our personal irritation, we don't try to pass off as righteous indignation because you and I need to be angry for the right reasons. Some people get angry when their toes are stepped on. Some people get angry because somebody hurt their feelings. Some people get angry because somebody wronged them. If you look at the life of Jesus, not one time did he get angry when a personal wrong was done to him. When they were driving the nails in his hands and placing him on the cross, you know what he said? Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Stephen said the same thing when he was being stoned. One of the first martyrs. Because they had Righteous indignation, not personal irritation. I tell you what, you, you take somebody's parking space or pew in a Baptist church, you'll see anger at another level. I tell you what, it's, it's, it's like Hades has opened up. You and I need to realize it's not personal irritation. It's righteous, righteous indignation. Be angry for the right reason. Be angry at the right thing. You know, there's a problem in pulpits today. You get these preachers and... If you know me well enough, you know I don't bang the pulpit. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, as long as it's done in the right spirit. The reason a lot of people don't come to church anymore, and the reason the church is struggling in reaching people with the gospel, is because we have an angry approach at how we share the gospel. You aren't going to win anybody to Jesus by shouting in their face and banging the pulpit. You aren't going to win a soul to Jesus like that. You might win them by, you know... And they ought to feel guilty, but it shouldn't be, from our power, it ought to be the Holy Spirit convicting them of their sin. You've got to hate the sin. I tell you, you've got to hate sin. I tell you what, I'll preach, I'll, and I haven't preached on it yet, but I'll preach on alcoholism, and I'll preach on liquor and the dangers of that. But my gracious, if I can't do it and love the alcoholic who's struggling with that sin, I need to shut my mouth and get out of the pulpit. I tell you what, the modern thing today is homosexuality. Homosexuality is sinful. There is everywhere in the Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, it's, it's sinful. But if I can't preach against homosexuality and how it's sin and love the homosexual who's warring with their flesh, then I need to get out of the pulpit.
If I can't preach about those who, are, uh, those who have had an affair and how affairs are wrong, but I can't love the couple who's struggling to make it work, then I need to get out of the pulpit. And you and I need to recognize that we either need to love the sinner and hate the sin, or we, just, we need to get along with the Lord and allow Him to work on us. Because we need to be angry at the sin. Sin is something to be angry about. Sin is something we shouldn't uh, give a free pass to and say, I'll tell you, you sin as much as you want to come to the church house. But we want you to come to the church house and realize that is sin. But there's hope for a new life in Christ because we have been made new creatures. Revelation 1 says, behold, he's made all things new. And we recognize that God has made us new this morning. Anger gets us nowhere. I'll close with this. Will Rogers, he was known for his laughter. He was also known how to weep. And one day he was entertaining at the Milton H. Berry Institute in Los Angeles. It was a hospital for, specialized, for those specialized in rehabilitating polio victims, people with broken backs, and just, just severe, chronic, horrible illnesses. And so Will Rogers came. He came to a show. Everybody was laughing. Everybody loved it. And he left the platform suddenly and went to the restroom. Milton Berry followed him to the restroom, walked in, and he saw him leaning against a wall, absolutely sobbing like a child. Closed the door in just a few minutes. Will Rogers came back up like nothing had happened and came on in his regular jovial spirit and continued the show. You see, the difference is if you want to learn what a person is really like, you ask them three questions. You ask them what makes them laugh, what makes them weep, and you ask them, most of all, what makes them angry. You'll be surprised to learn about a Christian not by their actions. You can't judge a person by their actions. I don't care who told you that. I don't care if you learned that in third grade. That, that's absolute bunk. Throw that out the window. You can't judge a person by their actions. You judge them by their reactions. You see how they react to problems. You see how they react to blessings. You see how they react to compliments. You see how they react to criticism. And you'll find a true person whether they're walking with Christ or not. Because I'll tell you, when, when something comes and they react, what's in the heart begins to come out. You judge a man not by his actions. You judge them by their reactions. And you, you look at Jesus and his reactions. He reacted with the right response for the right reasons. In 1894, and I promise I will close with this, good gracious. In 1894, I've got to say this, I found this, and I thought, man, I've got to use it, and I'm never going to be able to use it again. In 1894, I was reading, it was springtime, the Baltimore Orioles came to Boston to play a routine baseball game. But what happened that day was anything but routine because the Orioles' John McGraw had gotten into a fight with the Boston third baseman, Tommy Tucker. Within minutes, all the players from both Baltimore and Boston we're in an all-out brawl on the, on the baseball diamond, hitting and punching and blood going everywhere. It was quite the sight to behold. Well, they, the fans got to cheering it on, and well, they started getting into a fight, and so everybody in the, fight, in the stands were beginning to fight. And well, something happened, and one of the, one of the, among the fans, the conflict went from bad to worse. Someone set fire to the stands, and the entire ballpark burned to the ground. And not only that, but the fire spread to 107 other Boston buildings as well and burned all them to the ground because of one person's anger. I want to tell you something this morning. If you think that little temper tantrum you throw in front of your children or you throw in front of your spouse or you throw at work or you throw at church or whatever, if you think that's going to produce any righteousness at all, you're incredibly mistaken because anger produces nothing but horrible, horrible sin. Be angry for the right reasons. Be slow to anger. Be slow to speak. That's one thing I've got to work on, be slow to speak. Don't fly off the handle. Don't run around half-cocked thinking your G.I. Joe going to save the day. You're not. Something's going to be said mistake, and it's going to, you're going to have a lot of cleanup to do. But most importantly, be quick to listen. Not to what this old little old preacher has to say. Be quick to listen to what God has to say. That you might open God's Word and say, God, my life's a mess, but only you can fix it. What do you have to say to me today? And spend time with Him. Because you cannot, in your own power and strength, you cannot, cannot 
fix things yourself, understand things yourself, listen to yourself. You listen to your People say, trust your heart, follow your heart. Don't follow your heart. Please don't follow your heart. It's the worst advice anybody's ever given. You follow your heart, you're going to end up in a mess. You follow the Lord, you'll always be right. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Would you bow your heads with me? Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we're grateful. The book of James is so practical. We can open it, see just a few words, and understand exactly what you meant. Because, Father, your word was not meant to be confusing. It wasn't something that, Father, was meant to conflict the church or your children. It was something that's to clearly move us onward in our Christian faith. But, Father, we pray that as Christians, as your people, as people look to us, Father, we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Because we know that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Father, remind us of that. Father, I pray for any of us here that we might make a commitment to renew ourselves, to purified hearts, to clean lips, to a clear mind. That, Father, you would be able to continue to use us purified and holy, sanctified and secure. That we would be able to continue to be on mission for you without any doubt or distraction that might deter those away from trusting in you. Father, as always, your invitation's open. Your word tells us today is the day of salvation. Father, I pray for those that may be gathered here this morning who may have never come to Christ, that, Father, they'd make that glorious decision today to trust in you as Savior and Lord. Father, I pray for those who may want to unite with this church in membership that they would come They'd be a part of what you're doing here at Mount Zion Baptist Church. And I pray for those, Father, who might need to follow you in some other decisions, such as believer's baptism, or well, those things, and making a commitment to follow you. Father, bless this invitation that you would be glorified. We'll be careful to praise you for what you do now. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing our closing hymn. As we're standing, I want to remind you the altar's open for you to come and pray and respond. I'd love to pray with you, uh, if you if you desire for me to do so. As Brother Randall comes and leads us in our closing hymn. Number 550 in our hymnals, I would, I'd rather have Jesus. Amen. I hope that you have a wonderful Sunday. I do have to correct myself. I did say in the bulletin, I said the meeting was at 4. It actually is at 4.30. I don't know what I was thinking 4 o'clock for. Uh, but it, the interest meetings at 4.30 will meet in the women of, I believe it's the women of joy class, Miss Carolyn Puckett's class, last classroom down the hall on your left. And so I uh, hope to see some of you tonight for our Guatemala trip interest meeting. Uh, and then uh, I hope that you'll be here tonight. We'll continue our sermon series through 1 Corinthians come next Sunday night. Bring a friend October 1st uh, for uh, New Ground. I hope that you'll come and make plans to come. I'm going to ask, if you will, Brother A.G. Step, dismiss us in prayer this morning.